Hello and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment, the podcast. I'm your host, Phil Friedrich, and today I'm honored to have Zach Terrell with me. Zach is a former uh, Western Michigan standout quarterback, NFL player, and now he's doing some great leadership in the business world. And something that I'm really excited to talk about today is how to grow as a leader. Um, you know, Zach played quarterback, and uh, that's obviously a position of leadership. Uh, but throughout his uh, career, there were different times where people might have questioned that. So I'm excited to talk about growing. So Zach, thanks so much for being on today. Thanks for having me, Phil. Happy to be here. Yes, sir. So I'm always curious, um, you know, people fall in love with a sport for many different reasons, but, you know, talk a little bit about growing up and what it was about, you know, football and basketball that kept you, uh, you know, really excited to practice and get better. Yeah, it's interesting when you when you called about the podcast being about moments, you know, you you think of a pivotal moment of, you know, specifically for my career for football, right? But when I started thinking about like moments and what, you know, led me to to football and to the career and to the leadership aspect of playing quarterback, really what I thought about first was actually my basketball career, as funny as that is. I'm from yeah. Indiana, so I'm a Hoosier. <laughs> basketball is, I think they put them in our cribs when we're born, <laughs> right? So and That's the gift um, at the hospital, not a blanket of basketball. Yeah, exactly. No blankets, basketball. <laughs> you have to have a basketball hoop in your driveway. It's mandatory. You have to watch Hoosiers by the time you're five. <laughs> so um, I grew up playing basketball and football, but basketball was my first love. So my freshman year of, of high school, I broke my thumb on my throwing hand, so I couldn't play football the whole season. But I played basketball, and I had a breakout year, had a lot of scholarships, you know, was – played on a lot of the big AU circuit teams. And that's where most people thought I was going. That's what I'm known for in my hometown is basketball, not for football. Um, and then turns out my junior year, I was supposed to go to the Under Armour All-American Combine. And at that time, that was before recruiting had become as, you know, as big as it is today, where they yeah. knew everything about you, anything and everything you want to know. Nowadays, back then, you had to go places in order to get exposure. Yes. And uh, a couple of my buddies had gone the year before and got a ton of offers, so on and so forth. I'd had, you know, two years at that point of my sophomore and junior year of football, of, you know, being an all-state player and putting myself at least on the radar. So I'm going out to this, this camp and I tell my basketball coach about it. I'm going to miss a game. And uh, it was against, you know, one of the worst teams in the city. I'm like, you're going to be fine, blah, blah, blah. My parents had paid for it. Well, fast forward, we get to the moment, right, where I'm like, hey, the week of, hey, I'm going to go to this camp. I just want to remind you of it. He's like, you can't go. And I'm like, well, my parents have paid for it. My <laughs> parents are going out for me. It's going to give me exposure for football. I haven't decided whether I'm going to play basketball or football at this point, right? Yeah. He's like, no, no, you know, they had been struggling in the season. I had had an injury kind of lingering from football. And so they're like, he's like, no, you can't go. We need the team needs you here, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I'm going. He's like, <laughs> well, then you're off the team. And I was like, wait, like me of all people, you know, a little entitled feeling like there's no way that I'm not able yeah. to be able to, play. you know, that's never going to happen. You know, right. I'm the best player or whatever, so on and so forth. So my, actually my uh, dad, <laughs> my dad and me and the coach sit down and the coach is like, nope, you can't go. And my dad's like, what? I said, I looked at my dad right in front of my coach. I said, he's not a man of his word. I don't want to play for him. Mm -hmm. And I got up and walked out and my dad just kind of chases after me. He's like, Hey, are you sure you want to do this? And, and good for my dad, like, you know, giving me the choice. Right. Right. Cause really, you know, I have all these scholarships. I don't have any football scholarships to date, but I have basketball scholarships. Yeah. Right? And my parents, you know, they do fine, but then, you know, we're not, you know, wealthy by any means, you know, I'm the first kid to get a full ride scholarship in any yeah. sport, my whole yeah. family, extended family. And here I am walking out, potentially going to lose it all. Yeah. Just because a coach didn't live up to his word. Yeah. And, uh, you do talk about moments. You really learn about yourself in a moment like that, where you walk away from everything, quote unquote. Right. And I think that's really what set my values as, mm. as a person. It really set my, you know, my leadership trajectory off as to where, Hey, like I'm going to live by these core values and, you know, I'm not going to sacrifice any of them, no matter what, no matter how uncomfortable it makes me. And I yeah. think that really sent the benchmark for my life, you know, and looking yeah. back at the time, it seemed just like the right thing to do. It didn't seem like a big deal. Now, looking back at it, if I was my dad, I'd be like, absolutely not. 
you, you go make up with the coach and we'll yeah. figure out a solution. Right. Um, but you know, good for my parents. And I, I attribute a lot to them and the way I was raised and, you know, you know, sticking up for what you believe in and doing what's right. And, uh, you know, long story short, you know, I end up getting a scholarship to Western, but it was, it was not the way I pictured it to turn out. You know, yeah. everybody thought being, I was like the top quarterback in Indiana. There's a guy named Gunnar Keel, who was yeah. the number one quarterback and player out of Indiana who knew there were two good quarterbacks in one year. Right. <laughs> so he got all the attention. I didn't get any of the offers that everybody was telling me I was going to get. And I went a long time without having any offers. I lost all my basketball scholarships because I didn't play the basketball season. Yeah. So I kind of got blacklisted and, here we are today on a podcast talking about moments and uh, uh, you, you took me down that rabbit hole and I started thinking about, it. I was like, man, that was crazy. That That is. So there's a lot I want to unpack there. One of the things I want to start with though, is, you know, to your point, having people in your life that are true to their word. And, you know, for me, whether you want to call it, you know, they're honest, they're transparent, they're loyal, they have integrity, right? I mean, however you want to kind of chop it up. Um, I think those are characteristics that, you know, when you really look at who you're going to surround yourself with and who you're going to invest your time in, uh, those are really important characteristics. And so talk a bit about that for you in your life and how you make sure the people you're allowing into your close circle are going to, you know, have those characteristics um, even today, right? Yeah. No, I, I I use a compass as kind of like a symbol, right? Because a compass directs people. Obviously, mm -hmm. we don't use compasses a lot anymore. But, <laughs> you know, back in the day, everybody would use like a compass to direct them, right? Yeah. So the people that I have within my compass are people that have directed me and got me to where I am. And they always say, you know, like, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Or, you know, yeah. you take an average of your, your 10 closest friends and, you know, they tell you, you know, how successful you're going to be, right? Yep. So there's sp specific people in my life that have definitely, you know, carried me in a different direction. And you talk about like leadership, right? There's four people that have created four different things within my life and give me four different directives, right? One is vision, right? Mm. You know, I've had PJ Fleck in my life, who's the head coach at Minnesota, yeah. who is the ultimate visionary. You know, the guy's got row the boat as a mantra, but it is set a vision, right? Of what you're yeah. going to achieve, what we're going to be about, right? You talk about vision values the first person i think about is you know my youth pastor brandon holler mm -hmm. he's a guy that kind of like molded me and made me the faith become my own right and become yeah. the man I am and, and the values that i have set right and yeah. then you have then the other so it's two v's and two c's and the other is caring and consistency like mm -hmm. when i think of caring i think of you know i think of my father right i think of somebody that you know Caring is associated with love and love is sacrifice. And there's mm. nobody that sacrificed more for me in my life than, than my mother and my father. Right. So, mm. you know, people don't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care kind of thing. Yeah. Like I know how much my dad cares because <laughs> yeah. of, because of situations like I talked about earlier. Right. And then consistency, right. Yeah. Being consistent. And I think that's one of the most overlooked things, but the person mm. I think of is, is my president today, Aaron Ziegler. He is consistent with his messaging. He is a consistent leader. On a yeah. daily basis, you know exactly what to expect. And that's what you want on as a leader. And those are the people I kind of try to just surround myself with are people that have vision, values, that care, and that are consistent. I love um, it. Otherwise, I don't have time for you. Like I think of college, I had those kind of people around me. I yeah. had walk-ons were my roommates for all four years. And not that walk-ons make it any, you know, anything different, but I think that they're people that you know, chose to be around me and I chose to be around them. You know, normally you congregate to the star wide receiver or offensive lineman. Yeah. You know, most of my buddies hardly played, but they supported me and they made me better and they hmm. held me accountable and they had all those things. And I think that's really important. And I, I still have a lot of those people in my life today. I love that, man. That's good. Rewind that. Listen to it. Two C's, two V's. Those are good. Yeah. Now, clearly from an early time frame, though, you had leadership qualities because in high school you were a three time captain. And, you know, anyone that plays sports or I mean, you know, there's a lot of activities where there's a captain. Right. It, it not only means that usually you're one of the better players, but it also means you're one of the most respected players. Right. And so just talk a little bit about that. I mean, that's a big deal as a sophomore getting the nod when typically that's a, you know, an upperclassman uh, type of an accolade. Yeah. 
Well, I got to be honest. I don't really like captain because captain a lot of times goes, like you said, to the best player on the team, not the yeah. best. Yeah. So I like, I like leader more than captain. I hate the word captain, manager. Word, words have power in my life. Yep. I think words have power, right? You call yourself a manager, that's what you're going to do with your people. Now, if you're a leader, you're going to lead, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. same thing with the captain is I think it feels like it gives you like a sense of entitlement that you're you're given a C on your chest just because you're better than everybody else. And I think that's one thing I learned from an early age is that, you know, leadership is so important and there's just not as many leaders as we like to believe out there. Yeah. And um, I think that's one thing that you talk about, about intangibles is that I realized early on that I maybe wasn't the most talented. And I know that about myself. I'm very practical in that sense, but I can have an edge with my mind and with my soul and with the way that I lead. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So I think that's one thing that differentiated me early on. And I kind of got realized that, you know, that I had some ability, don't get me wrong, but what was going to carry me further were those intangibles and that leadership ability, being able to unite 105 guys to a common goal, um, which is not easy to do. No, I love that, man. Now, as you are graduating and getting through high school, once again, you have a great high school career. And so that's setting up the opportunity to pursue um, the college career. And yeah, Western Michigan, um, my guess is probably not the school that you were hoping was going to be the one you were going <laughs> to you were going to pick from a scholarship offer. You know, I mean, I imagine uh, being yeah. in Ohio, there, there's, uh, you know, a, a certain team that uh, might have been more of the ideal candidate. But yeah. Western Michigan ends up being the place. So for you, is there any type of a chip on your shoulder heading in being like, "Ooh, I want to prove some schools wrong? Or was it more of I'm just thankful for the opportunity. Let's go get after it. You know, I was thankful, but there's definitely, I, I tell people it wasn't a chip. It was more of a crack because I definitely, uh, you like, you know, any athlete or any like successful business person or whatever, you yeah. use different mo- things to motivate you because, yes. you know, you can get the mundane and the, the constant every single day, whether it's no's or whatever it is. Yeah. People, you know, life is hard. Life comes at you. So you need motivation. And I used it. I, I refer my refer to myself in college, and I stole this from Coach Fleck as the king of the twos. You know, too yep. short, too slow, from too small of a town, whatever. You know, yep. just creating things that may may not have been real to begin with, but you know, use them as motivation and a crack on my shoulder to to uh, motivate me to be better. And yep. uh, you're right, not the place I wanted to end up um, at all, not where I expected. For sure. But yeah, there was a sense of uh, gratitude too, though, as I've told, you know, I told you the early part of my story is going from no scholarships to, you know, not playing basketball to really football was it. It's like, hey, got to get one now. So in Western, fortunately, they're my first. So, um, you know, obviously I'm a pretty loyal person because <laughs> I stuck with them through and a couple of the schools I wanted to get came in late trying to, you know, you know, switch me over. But Fortunately, uh, I stayed and, you know, the rest is history, even though it wasn't exactly the smoothest. Yeah. But. Now, something I want to highlight here, and I think it's so interesting, um, you know, in the different episodes we've had and people we've had on is, I think for most people at some point in their life, they do have a chip on their shoulder and or a crack, however we want to call it. Sometimes people would say it's a boulder on their shoulders. Yeah. And I think there is a point in time where it's really beneficial to have that as extra motivation to, you know, help you do the unrequired things when you wouldn't otherwise do it just because you have that, you know, baggage that you're trying to prove someone wrong. But I think there also becomes this dynamic and this shift where all of a sudden it's like, it's actually almost holding me back because I'm trying to prove someone wrong instead of seeing what my true potential could be. Right. It's like, ooh, well, as long as I prove them wrong, then I'm good. But it's like, well, that actually might limit what you're actually capable of if you really took the blinders off and just went. So I guess maybe talk a little bit about that, that dynamic of, hey, it's good for motivation, but there is a point where it might limit you. Yeah, I think I think it's how you use it, how you let Mm -hmm. it motivate you. Right. And also, like we talked about the people that surround you is the people that can, you know, keep you humble, keep you hungry, you know the sense of entitlement can creep in in all aspects of life, especially when you're successful. Yep. Um, I think how I, I was able to, uh, the I, life kind of kept me hum- humble, right? Yeah. You go through that situation as a junior in high school, and then in, fast forward a little bit, you know, in 2013, uh, you go one and 11 in a football season. You're the worst quarterback in college football, right? It's pretty easy 
to uh, be humble. Yeah. And it, you kind of you never forget that. You don't forget being in a lecture hall in the front row when a teacher's you know talk bashing the quarterback and the football team, and she doesn't realize you're in the front row. You don't forget those things. You don't, right? Right. right. But it, it keeps you humble, and it makes you hungry, and it makes you you know you're right. There, there's a healthy balance there, right? Yeah. But it really did ground me to a degree of where I knew like it didn't matter how much success I was going to have. I'm never going back to that, but I'm never going to forget it ever. Yeah. So there's a healthy balance with it for sure. I think that's really good. Now <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. So first year, I would love to say, Hey, you show up to Western, right? You got, you know, this oh, wow. crack. yeah, you got this crack on your shoulder. You're like, Oh, we're turning the ships around, right? The tide is turning folks, but we show up and year one goes one and 11. So Talk a little bit about, you know, transitioning into that. I mean, once again, when you're, it, it's it's a tough transition because you go from being the guy to you can still be maybe the starter on your team, but if you're not winning, it doesn't feel nearly as good. So talk a little bit about that uh, first season and some of the lessons learned on 111. Yeah, I mean, let me just rewind just a touch, even 2012, because my first year I redshirted. Yes. That's even like a weirder transition. I know a lot of guys are used to that. And a lot of people have had to do it. And you're right, you go from being the guy to not even playing and not even an option of playing, right? right? So I, after my first season, they fired the coach that I came in with. So he's yeah. gone. His son was offensive coordinator. He's gone. Everybody's gone, right? So, yeah. and that was a tough year. I was the backup the whole season, but never got to play. So I'm doing all the work, doing all the training, traveling, you know, so I'm I'm never around for the weekends getting to meet people. I'm playing catch up because the starting quarterback who had been there for three years hurts his finger. So they didn't really coach me in the offseason because they thought I had a whole year to register. Right. Well, that didn't happen. It's like, hey, you're literally one play away from starting. So yeah, figure it out. Um, so that was a huge transition. And I just remember being absolutely miserable, just miserable. And I remember like walking back and forth from the stadium to the dorms, just like crying, calling my mom, you know, being just like a, like, it was like, I was a little kid all over <laughs> again. Yeah. And I remember the season's over. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to transfer. Right. Yeah. I'm out. I'm going to go to either Miami of Ohio, but then their coach gets fired. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do what's comfortable. Right. When things are tough, we always kind of, we go back to what's comfortable. Revert to the mean. Yeah. Yeah. My whole family all went to small Christian colleges, right? Mm -hmm. My dad and brother both played at Taylor University in Indiana. Yes. Yeah. in school. Yep. Hey, this is comfortable, right? Yeah. Let's go back to Taylor. You're going to be a superstar. Everybody's going to pat you on the back. Life easy, which is what you're seeing a lot nowadays, right? Let's go to what's comfortable, right? Let's transfer. Yeah. Let's leave. And, you know, for some people, that's the right decision. Yep. I, I don't disagree with some of those decisions, but for some people, it's not. It's not the best decision. Sometimes you got to go through the hard stuff in order to get, you know, get to the really good stuff. Yeah. Really, frankly, that's generally when the good stuff comes, right? right? So I take, fortunately, I met a cute girl who is now my wife. That's the reason why I stuck around. I didn't transfer. I stuck around. I said, I'm going to see what this PJ Flex all about. Because yeah. what does a boat, if you don't know, he's the row the boat guy. So yep. mantras row the boat. What does a boat have to do with the Bronco? And if somebody can figure that out for me, I owe you, I owe you dinner because it has nothing to do with the Bronco. I've still yet been yet to figure it out, but I'm like, let's see what this guy's all about. And I yeah. stayed, man. And it was wild. I think we got 30 guys off the team. They kicked off the team. Uh, I mean, it, we didn't have enough guys for spring game. football team you're the worst quarterback and it was just i mean it was the low of the lowest and you learn a lot about yourself in those kind of situations yeah so when pj comes in you know once again you guys don't necessarily hit it off right away there's some I don't want to say animosity between the two of you, but it's not like it's this love at first sight relationship between you and PJ. So, you know, talk a little bit about the growing pains and, uh, you know, some of the conversations that are had, because I know there, there becomes one point in time where he, uh, he calls you into the office and says, Hey, I don't think you're a very good leader. And, 
And that, that doesn't sit well with anybody, uh, let alone, you know, uh, a guy that has been a great leader for his whole life. It's like your, it's like your boss calls you into the office and he, and he or she says, you're not good at your job. Because yeah. the main job description of being a quarterback is to be a leader. <laughs> right, you know, right. I think that's the number one job of a quarterback. So, yeah, and it was uh, shocking to me because I, di- I didn't have that impression of myself. And like yeah. you said, like I said earlier, a little bit of humble pie, right? And it's like, I need to look myself in the mirror. It's like, this coach doesn't like me, right? I need to leave. And, uh, and I remember my dad being like, he's like, you know, that doesn't sound very good. If I said that to employee, uh they're getting fired right. they're fi- or I'm finding a way to replace them. And he was yeah. trying to replace me. Yeah. But fortunately enough, I took a step back and I, I listened to what he had to say. Yeah. And I said, you know, there's some truth to this. Mm-hmm. And basically what he was saying is, Hey Zach, you have all the ability, but you're not using it. You're not vocal, right? You're not seeing what I'm seeing, but He's he and credit to Coach Fleck. He said, I'm going to give you the tools and I'm going to show you what I think you need to do in order to be the best leader or what I know you need to do to be the best leader. And if you do it, you'll be successful. You know, those who stay will be champions. Well, those who grow as leaders will become leaders. And um, unfortunately, I got a guy who's, in my opinion, the best leader I've ever been around in Coach Fleck. And I watched, I listened, I absorbed and uh you know, I got outside of my comfort zone and it made me a way better leader because of it and uh, has set me up for the rest of my life uh, because of it. So I can't thank him enough. But yeah, it was not it was not a fun conversation, but it was the right one. Yeah. Now, I I think there's a couple of great points to take out of there. One is you mentioned, hey, when he comes in, 30 guys are either asked to leave or decide to leave the program. And, yeah. you know, it's always tough to make a decision in the in the moment because it's like well dang it now what right like who's gonna replace the starting safety if the starting safety leaves but when you're trying to build a culture and that's a cliche term today but i mean it's a real thing right when you're trying to build an environment that is what you believe in sometimes as good of a player is or as talented as a player is if they don't mesh well with the system or they don't mesh well with what you're trying to accomplish the team's not going to go as far right and so you have to take that maybe potentially step back for a time frame to get to the slingshot of where you want to go. And the next three years, right? I mean, really are that for you guys, you go from one and 11 to eight and five to 13 and 0 regular season playing in a new year's bowl game. So talk a little bit about that, what you were feeling when the transition is starting to kind of seeing the progression happen. Yeah. It's like the one and 11 season, you can tell that maybe 1% of the guys are on board with the coach yeah. and this row the boat mantra, um, which is a fascinating uh, concept. And uh, he's written a book about it, but he needs to dive a lot deeper because there's a lot to it. And we can go through it later if, if you want. Yes, but, sir. Uh, the one in 11 is kind of, you know, 1%. Then we go eight and five, and we go to a bowl game, we go to the Idaho Potato Bowl and lose. And uh, I'd say 25%. The next year, we go eight and five again. But we win a bowl game. We win our first bowl game. We played Ohio State that year. They won the national championship. We played Michigan State. They won the Rose Bowl. We played Georgia Southern. They went 13 and one or 12 and one, I think. So we played championship teams. So we got to see what it looked like. Yeah. Um, And that was huge for the development. And then I think about 50% were on. And then finally going into that last year, everybody's like, okay, we've seen what championship football looks like. We know we have a championship team. And yeah. there's this level of belief. And and with success, I'm a firm believer that sometimes you need to, to see success in order and to see what it looks like in order to know what it what it is and how to accomplish it. No so, doubt. That was the key, is getting to see it, right? And you, you go against those teams and you see how they prepare. You see how they play. You see where they are physically. And you're like, I'm not there. And I, but I want to get there. So that was the key. Well, yeah. And, you know, I mean, once again, in a sports mindset, right. It's, you know, on Wednesday practice, they're not doing what we're doing, right. They, you know, in their after hours on Saturday night after the game, not everyone's doing, you know, certain things that maybe some of our guys are doing, but in the work, in the work world today, you know, you sit there and you say, same thing, right. Hey, the person that showed up and, you know, 
is diligent throughout their day versus, Hey, the person that, you know, is goofing around watching YouTube videos. Like, yeah, we're creating separation. We're creating a different uh, type of a culture and results are going to show over time. It may not be after one day of me watching YouTube videos and you working your tail off, but sure. Certainly after two years of doing that, right. We're going to be getting yeah. separated. And so that's what you guys got to see is you're playing against the elites, but you're also gaining momentum winning yourselves. Oh, absolutely. And confidence, right? Yeah. You know, confidence is huge. And um, I mean, anybody that's successful has tremendous amounts of confidence. Yep. And um, but that's built from that's built from repetition. That's built from failure and yes. learning because failure is growth. Right. Yeah. And I mean, we I've done a lot of failing athletically and in business and in life. And it's taught me a lot. And I think you'd say I'm sure you'd say the same thing. Right. Absolutely. I mean, failing teaches you more than success. And unfortunately, that's just the way I feel like it has to be. I wish I was the lucky person that just, you know, you know, come from a trust fund family that was a superstar and whatever, had everything handed to me. That's just not the case. It's never been my life. Yep. I always joke around with my wife. I was like, it's going to be the hard way. And then eventually it's going to pay off. That's 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 the story of my life, you know, as you've heard it today. And yep. But you know what? It continues to pay off. And uh, I think it makes it way more gratifying when you're all said and done with it. And I'm sure, Phil, I mean, I can imagine anybody that's had any level of success has had failures and I and, and it makes it so much more worth it and gratifying. Mm, absolutely. So to talk about the row the boat mantra, right? So to your point, you're a Western Michigan Bronco. You're like, dude, what the heck is this mantra thing about? But, you know, it gets planted. And then to your point, if we're consistent with our messaging, uh, it starts to buy in or people start to buy in. We start to have beliefs. So talk, of, give us, a, you know, a little bit of a deep dive into the row the boat mantra and what that cultivated for the team. Yeah. So the row the boat mantra, I mean, it's a never give up, give up kind of, you know, way of life. And um, there's a lot of parts to it and it's very diverse and complex. And I mean, I don't know how many hours are, you know, days and weeks and years, coach Fleck took putting this together but it really is it's an impressive it's an impression impressive vision and values and a playbook to life on how you can get through and how you can not just get through it but be successful mm -hmm. and you know there's you know you got the responsibility trust belief which is those are the core values that are built into the mantra right and then you have all these other pieces you know you got the oars the boat you know the way that rowing the boat is right you're back is towards the future. You're looking at yeah. the past, but you're growing in the present, which is a great way to look at life, right? Hmm. You know, we learn from our past, but we're we need to be in the present. I'm yeah. um, you know, we need to be in the neutral, right? Yeah. Um, and not looking, you know, we're not looking towards the future. Our work and what we're doing now is going to get us to where we want to go. So, I mean, just that mantra alone is, I mean, it's incredible. It really is. And uh it it it's some people think it's a gimmick, but it's not. Because you talk to anybody that's been in these programs and anybody that's you know been around him, he lives it. Yeah. He's consistent. Every day you're gonna hear all the boat. Right? You yeah. you call Coach Flack right now, he's gonna I'm gonna say, How are you doing? He's gonna say elite, right? But that yeah. same thing has spread down to me. You call Ziggler Auto Group in Kalamazoo, you call any of my stores, it's an elite day here at Ziggler, right? Because yeah. That's what he does, man. He's a visionary and it spreads like wildfire. Love you go it. up to Minnesota, you're going to see oars all over the place. And it's like, what the heck is it? Now they have lakes. We have a lot of yeah. lakes, which help. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it, it is really impressive what a vision and what a mantra and a consistent messaging can do for a group of people. Yeah. It really well, is. And, and I love what you just said too, though. He lives it. Right. How many leaders or people in positions of authority? I, I always like to differentiate. There's a difference between a leader and a person that's in a position of authority. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But there's so many people that are in positions of authority that it's like, you're not doing what you're asking me to do. Like, how do you expect me to, to buy into this if you're not going to be willing to pave the way and show me how that is supposed to be? Well, that's where I, when I talk about the second seed, the consistency. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, leadership. Being consistent is probably the hardest of the, the four qualities I described. Yeah. Consistency is difficult in anything in life. 
think of all the people right now. We're in January. How many people are doing weight loss or working out or reading books or financially, you know, working on themselves? Yep. How many people have already fallen off? I bet you 50%. Absolutely. At least. Right. Because consistency is the hardest thing in life. It requires discipline. Right. Yeah. And every day he had to tell, wake himself in the morning. And he's like, I'm going to be energetic because the guy's like the energizer bunny. That's not the wall. Right. Yeah. I got to be energetic. I'm going to be consistent with my messaging. Right. I can't slip. I can't. I'm the leader. I cannot slip. I've got to be the pinnacle for what they look up towards. And it yeah. requires, you know, me to be on my game all the time. Yep. And that's what he required of himself. And, you know, to his credit, he did it. He's did a tremendous job at Western and he's kept it going for, you know, I think it's been six, seven years now in Minnesota. It's incredible. Yes. So to talk a little bit into this, you know, final year for you, though, I mean, going 13 and 0, I mean, anytime you can go undefeated, you know, usually after about three or four games, you know, you get to that three, four, you start knowing like every team now has you guys on the calendar is like, all right, team to beat. And when you're undefeated, you get their best effort every single game at a heightened level, but you get the 13. zero. you get to show up and play Wisconsin along the way. You're having phenomenal, um, you know, personal career. I mean, you end up setting the record for yards, uh, you know, in a career, Talk a bit about that senior year and just, you know, the fun you had along the way and kind of it in and of itself. Yeah. I, you know, I, I try to, when, when I look back on it, it's hard not to just be just really thankful yeah. um, for the way that it turned out. Um, you know, I, I, I'm thankful for all the failures and all the growth I went through, but it really, was rewarding to get have that 2016 season you know we went 13 and 0 and went to the cotton bowl you know and then all the awards and accolades you know me winning the academic heisman was uh certainly a highlight getting to stand in front of my one of my heroes and peyton manning and you know in front of peyton manning my dad and pj fleck like three of my like <laughs> biggest heroes you're, right? you're mount rushmore right my, my Mount Rushmore right in front of me and getting to give just like a, just stand up in front of everybody and just thank the people that played a role into getting that point. And it all kind of comes to like a pinnacle, right? Where you're like, you know what? It was all worth it. It really was. Um, it didn't seem like it was going to be worth it at one point in time, but it was. And um, what was most special about it was not like the individual awards, but just getting to go through it with the guys because there was a select group of us that were there for one and 11 that made it through. There's only three of us that were there in 2012 that went through the coach that got fired. Okay. So, wow. that made it through. so Taylor Moten, the tackle I talked about started tackle for the Panthers. Uh, I don't know. Well, I guess I don't know if I talked about him. I was in a uh, football podcast before this. So I probably talked about him. Um, he, he he made it in another wide receiver. The three of us were the only ones that made it. And wow. we both I remember just after the game, after the MAC championship, we were 13 and 0, and we're all looking at each other and we're like, We did it. Yeah. We did it. And then the next day we find out we're going to the cotton bowl, and Coach Fleck had flashed it up on a screen before that season. And we didn't he didn't say anything about it. He flashed up on the screen quickly and took it down. We're all like, What what was that? Why was the cotton bowl logo on there? He didn't say anything. He kind of kept going. He was like subliminally yeah. putting it in. And none of us knew. That wasn't even on our radar. We hadn't that. won a match championship since 1988. Right? We are, we are, our, our, my school, Western Michigan University, is a program of average if you look at the years, right? Mm-hmm. They're about 500 winning percentage. We've won three MAC championships now in like 103 or 117 seasons or something crazy like that. Right. So it's average. It's never been the best. We've never had any type of notoriety like this, but this guy, PJ Fleck knew before we did before anybody, Mm -hmm. before they were hired, before anything, he knew like, Hey, my vision, I believe, and I'm going to put it somewhere in the back of their minds. And then when it came up, I was like, how in the world? He's like, I believe, man, I knew. Yeah. I knew when I took this job, I knew he's like, I thought I was going to do it. in. I thought I was going to do it in three years. And it took me four, but he's like, I had this plan all along. He's like, I was just waiting for you guys to believe like I did. And I was just like, dude, <laughs> let's go. Let's go. <laughs> it doesn't get better than you. Oh, you know? I, so, yeah. So gratifying. Yeah. It was really, really special, man. And, uh, 
you know, any, anybody who has a season like that, there's a lot of teams, you know, every team that wins the national championship, you look at TCU season, right? A program that's not used to something like that. It's changed all, it'll change all those guys' lives forever. I know mine certainly is. So um, it's really, really, it was really special for sure. Yes. So uh, you've had all this success. You've had team success. You've had individual success. So that, you know, opens doors to, all right, well, what's next after, you know, playing at a high level and having success. And so you're, you're on the radar of, Hey, there's, you know, potential opportunities of NFL draft, but by no means are people calling and saying, Hey, first round draft pick here, you know, here he is, here's Zach. So, you know, talk a little bit about being in that limbo world of like, you know, you're hitting your stride. I mean, you're, you're performing really well, but yet not necessarily getting at the next level, the, you know, open doors that a guy would probably want. Yeah. It was kind of back. It reminded me back to pre, you know, to high school again. Yeah. Like, it's like, where is everybody? You know, I <laughs> right. like was in that, I was in the Heisman race my senior year at one point, you know, I think I got a vote, like a third place vote. Yeah. Um, so I made it in like the finalists or pre like finalists. Yeah. And I was like, man, I must be pretty good at what I do. Right. And uh, and uh, winning the academic Heisman, you know, I was like, yeah. I'm like, this uh, NFL teams will appreciate this. I have the intangibles, right? Right. And uh, I signed as an undrafted free agent with the Ravens. And uh, most people know the National Football League stands for, uh, <laughs> or the NFL stands for National Football League. Well, for yep. me, it stands for not for long. So yep. that lasted like a week or two. So <laughs> then I... Uh, I went to the Jaguars for for a little bit and got cut. And I came back and, you know, it's back to square one. It's like, what do you want to do? Yeah. Who do you want to be? What's yeah. next? I mean, that's the toughest thing is like you, you've dedicated your life to a sport. And it's like, and I, and even, you know, people coming out of college, I sympathize with students like that. It's just like, what do you want to do? And right. uh, fortunately, you know, I had developed a network and I had worked hard through college to do that. But even after that, I mean, went in the academic Heisman opened a lot of doors that made it kind of made it even cloudier, made mm -hmm. it even more difficult for me post-college. And it was kind of like, I had to sit down and really reevaluate what I wanted to do next, what my next steps were. Yeah. Now I don't want to just graze over, uh, you know, what you had just mentioned on, man, I had put so much time and effort into becoming this football player. Now that's not really my what I'm hanging my hat on I got to go figure out what's next and yeah. I had Joe Hawley on and Joe you know played in the NFL for seven eight years with Falcons uh, Buccaneers and this guy takes a six month tour across the United States just driving around like trying to figure himself out but he goes you know it was hard for me to figure out who I was but he goes I think the harder part was no one else knew who I was outside of a football player. You know, my parents still, when they would show up to things, would be like, yeah, our son plays in the NFL. It's like, but no one would describe Joe, right? And so I think, yeah. you know, there's still even people that, you know, are around you and it's like, oh, you're the quarterback, right? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it, it, it's absolutely. a great thing. It's a complimentary thing, but you also are like, yeah, but I'm so much more than that. You know, like that was just one of the pieces of my life. So talk a little bit about that and just, you know, kind of rebranding yourself even within your own circle. Yeah, I think it was difficult to find out what I wanted to do, but I definitely knew who I was. Mm, yeah. so I can sympathize definitely with guys uh, having difficulties after. I totally get it because it's yeah. easy to get wrapped up in it. Um, I have a lot of buddies who really struggled after. Um, and they're still struggling, frankly. It's difficult. It's a difficult yeah. transition. You get a lot of people patting you on the back, a lot of people holding your hand. It's a big adjustment when you're done because uh, – Life isn't easy and the real world is tough and it'll chew you up and spit you out. And um, so I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew who I was. Mm -hmm. And I think that really helped me navigate what I wanted to do next, because there was a few things like I had my set of non-negotiables, right? I knew where I wanted to work, had to have this, 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 and this. Yep. And that did help me. And it took me a lot while to get there. I mean, I interviewed for three, four months all over the country. Wow, and uh, to end up where I'm at, and I've I've been at my company Ziegler Auto Group now for five years, and it is the last place I would have told you I was going to be when I was done. The last, yeah, yeah. But here I am, I absolutely love it, and uh, it all worked out fortunately. But yeah, I can totally understand why it's difficult for athletes, anybody, anybody. Yeah. When you're done with college, it's a big world, and it's like, what now? What do I do? 
I mean, it yeah. seems like you found it early. I know talking to you said you started your your business at 18. Like, good for you. Well, most of us aren't like that, right? <laughs> yeah, facts. <laughs> I had six extra years to figure it out. And I still couldn't. I think I was 23 or 24. I was like, I still couldn't figure it out. So good for you, Phil. Yeah. You, well, you, you I, you make us all look better. Hey, only thing in my life. Certainly not look, certainly not other things. But yeah, there we go. Now, and yeah, anyone listening, you know, even if you're a parent, right? I mean, there's so many parents that once their kids graduate, they are like, who am I, right? Because they've been so wrapped up in kids as accomplishments, achievements, activities. So no, that's good. Now, to get to where you're at, I know you had mentioned there was some letter that might have gotten written um, as you're uh, looking at different yeah. jobs and where you end up. So talk a little bit about uh, how, where you end up comes to be. Yeah, so in 2015, actually, uh, Coach Flex started bringing in some high-level executives into uh, into our locker room to speak to guys, to, sp yeah. to speak to our leadership council. He was really doing it for me because he knew that I probably wasn't going to be an NFL player, but I could be a, a leader and, you know, climb the corporate ladder quickly. Yeah. So he brought high-up executives at, you know, big companies like Strike or Pfizer – just to name a couple that people would recognize. Yeah. Well, one of them was Ziggler Auto Group, one of the, the, the largest privately owned auto group in the country. Okay. And he brings in Aaron Ziegler, Um, And all these guys talked to us. I think there was like seven of eight of them. And Aaron, and Co Coach Fleck had us write notes to him, which are nice notes. But I'm like, these guys know that he's making us write all these. I'm going to write a special note. I got these cards made, got my letterhead put on them and wrote them a personal note separately to each one of these guys. Right. Yeah. I mean, that note's paid off tenfold. Right. So um, Aaron Ziegler put that in the back of his mind, like, well, this kid is a little bit different. Yeah. Like he's, he's, he's the smart, that's a smart kid. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So a couple of years later, after we graduated, he had me come speak at his event, which was the first day of the draft, which I don't know. I don't think he really believed that I was going to be a first round draft pick, but, um, and you know, just it, it, it made a connection and it set me apart from everybody else. And that's yeah. kind of what led, led to the relationship. And like you said, like a letter is what kind of changed the trajectory, a moment like that of thinking like, Hey, everybody else is doing this. Like I got to do something different. I always say, if you want to make a difference, you got to do something different. Yep. Well, that's what happened to me. It's definitely made a big difference in my life for sure. I love it. Yeah, just being uncommon, right? That's it's not the normal thing to do. It's not the commonplace thing to do. So yeah. as, as you've transitioned into where you're at now, you get to lead people. And I think, you know, there's probably a lot of skill sets that you learn playing football that translate really well to what you're doing today. And you know, you're in a competitive industry, right? A competitive environment day in and day out. You're leading people that want to compete. Uh, we, we don't call it that in the business world, but that's what it is, right? Yeah. So, you know, talk about leading people now. Um, you know, as once again, you've had great leaders in your life and you're kind of you're creating your own, right? Mm -hmm. Your Absolutely. own mantras, your own belief systems, and people are having to buy into it. So talk about how you've kind of formed your mantras, but also how people have really bought into following Zach. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the leadership that I've taken and learned over time, and it is interesting now, kind of get to using it myself. I have 160 employees now. Um, so we got three rooftops, four manufacturers, 160 employees at the locations I oversee. And it is interesting now because, you know, it's my show and, yeah. and it's it's my leadership ability and it's getting to see who, who is Zach as a leader in the business world. But the thing I love about the auto the auto industry is it is like the ultimate locker room. It is so comp comparable to football. Yeah. It's not even funny. Like I have 160 employees. Well, I used to have 105, right? So yeah. there's a lot of, and it's competitive. I got somebody right across the street that sells the same, same thing I have. And it's, it's a want, it's rarely a need, yep. right? So it's, it's competitive, which gets my juices flowing every single day. Right. Um, so things like that are really what want now that I've joined the business would have kept me here. Cause it's like yeah. every day is a new challenge. This market is crazy you know that as a financial planner right yeah it's insane well we're one of the first people to see the changes in the market right. yeah. as a retail industry so i get a i get a peek into hey what's happening like hey the market is softening or hey man this is as 
this market is incredible, right? Yeah. And we get to kind of see that first. And uh, it's really interesting me on the ground floor. And then I'm a people person, right? Yeah. I want to be around people. I yeah. want to make an impact. And we have thousands of people a month coming through these doors that I get an opportunity to impact, whether it's directly myself or yeah. it's somebody that I work with. And that's really important to me. It's really important to provide people with the ultimate automotive experience. And another word for or a longer way to say elite, right? Yeah. That's really all it is. And um, it's just changing that verbiage to use it for our company. Yeah. Like this year, our mantra is necton mentality. That is a coach fleck thing. And a necton, I don't know if you know what a neck, you know what a necton is? That no, I don't. I don't. I'm sorry. Okay. I don't. <laughs> and so people might fact check me and coach fleck on this, but I never fact checked him. I just believed him blind faith. So Here's what it is. So it's like a great white shark, but it's a free flowing organism that's always swimming against the current that swims against the current that's always attacking and never full. Mm. So next time mentality, right? Always yeah. attacking, never full. We've had two years of unprecedented success. Yeah. How are you going to top it this year? Are you full? Are you complacent? Are you entitled? Because we've seen that kind of settle in. Yeah. But those are things that I've taken and used. And it's just like, man, this is gold. Like yeah. this is like this is the perfect mantra that we need for right now for our for our industry for for our team and um, you talk about taking things that you've learned from different leaders that's one thing for instance that we've used and like I told you earlier you call here they're gonna say it's an elite day at Ziegler yeah you know because that's what we are it's it's being different it's setting the bar higher and um, that's what's important to me is I don't like I don't like living life just being average I've been bad. Right. I've been really, really bad. I've been average. And then I've been elite. I really like the elite. I yeah. really, really like it. That was, uh, that's the view is a lot better from the top. Yes. Yes. Zach, I want to say thanks so much for being on today, man, and uh, just highlighting the pivotal moments. Are there any other, you know, moments that really stick out that you want to make sure we highlight today? Well, I think I would probably be in trouble if I didn't, uh, you know, the most pivotal moment in my life is obviously getting married to my beautiful wife, uh, who, it, to be honest with you, I would not be a state at Western if it wasn't for right. her. That's a true story. She was taking transferable credits as well. She was going to go back down to Georgia where she's from. And you know what? Support system. You you mm. asked me that question. Yeah. People like her that were able to support, but also push, you know, yeah. coming off the field, throwing a pick. She's the first one to be like, what were you looking at when you did that? Right holding me accountable, right? Yeah. You know, there's no off days when you got somebody like that, that's, that expects the best from you yeah. and um, it makes you better and it's challenging. And, you know, I fail every day as a husband and, you know, as a leader and uh, it, it, it's, it, it makes it more gratifying though, when you do find success and when you do find it together and it makes it a lot easier having a partner that's along with the ride with you to, to enjoy the journey. I love it, man. You know what? That It's unique that you said that. I hope your wife listens to this because we've done over 200 episodes and I can count on one hand how many people uh, probably believe that, but don't take the time to mention it. So uh, that that just speaks volumes, one, about you and how much you appreciate her, but two, how much she uh, you know is doing for you on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Oh, yeah. She puts up with me. I love it. Well, Zach, thanks again so much for being on, my man. Uh, once again, excited to see all the things you continue to do. And can't wait to uh, do this again in probably two years when instead of 150, you got, you know, 300 people that you're overseeing. And uh, and we'll see uh, all the new leadership uh, stories you have from there. That's awesome. And well, I really appreciate you having me 